Hello again. My name's Dane. I'm the festival director and it's a treat to welcome you to this event tonight called The Art of Fusion. We hope you have a good time. I'm going to pass on to Ella from the UK AAA, so the United Kingdom Atomic Energy Authority, who's going to lead you through this fun journey of an art of fusion. Ella, over to you. Thank you for that introduction. I'm just going to share my screen with that. Okay, thank you for the introduction and thank you for joining us this evening for, uh, for the art of fusion for this, uh, this event. Um, my name's Ella. I work for the UK Atomic Energy Authority and the UK AA are a scientific research facility based in South Oxfordshire, and they're researching fusion energy. But why are we having this discussion tonight? Well, we're starting a dialogue between the artistic world and the scientific world to show that they quite possibly have a lot more in common than you may have initially thought. Uh, the UK AA are also running an art competition by the same name, The Art of Fusion, uh, this is an opportunity for the public to show us what your interpretation of fusion is, and I will tell you more about this later on. As previously mentioned, there is a Q&A box, so if you have any thoughts or questions about the relationship between art and science while we're having this chat, then uh, please put your questions in the Q&A and we'll get to those uh, towards the end. So let me introduce you to the panel. Uh, as I said, my name's Ella. I work as a communications assistant for the UKAA. My background is in theatre and I studied English Lit at um, university and I joined the UKAA in August 2019. Joining me as well is Dr Chantal Nobbs, who is a senior radiometric researcher for the UKAA. Chantal did physics at university and did her PhD in nuclear physics and joined the UKAA in July 2017. And last but not least, we're joined by Rosemary Wise, who, uh, whose background is in fine art. Rosemary studied fine art at university and has worked as a botanical illustrator for the Department of Plant Sciences with the Oxford University since 1965. Thank you for joining me both. Uh, what I'm gonna do first is very briefly explain what fusion is for those of you who might not already know. Um, so fusion is this, this, shows you the uh, conditions that you need in order for fusion to occur. But I can appreciate that for some of you, this might be explanation enough, but for others, it might be a little bit difficult to decipher what it actually means. So I'll, I'll break it down for you. Fusion is star power. It's the process that powers our sun. And in order to make fusion, you first need a plasma. Now, what is plasma? Plasma is the fourth state of matter. So you have a solid, a liquid, a gas, and then a plasma. And to get to that, you heat up the previous stage. So we, to get to our plasma, we have our gas, which is essentially composed of atoms containing a negative uh, electron and a positively charged nucleus. Now, what makes this nucleus positively charged is, um, is the proton. So we take our gas, we heat it up, and we get a plasma. And when it becomes a plasma, the electron and the positively charged nucleus separate, allowing them to move around freely and independently of each other. And when it's in this state, it is ionized. And that means that it can be controlled using a magnetic force. But in order for fusion to occur, we need these uh, positively charged nuclei to, for want of a better word, fuse together. Um, but if you've ever played with magnets as a child or as an adult, you'll know that trying to force two positives together is incredibly difficult because they naturally repel each other. So how do we overcome this? Well, we put the plasma under such extreme conditions and heat it to such extreme temperatures that they're forced together so much so that they overcome this repulsion, a bit like this adorable animation down here. And when they fuse together, they create a huge amount of energy. And that is what the UK Atomic Energy Authority are researching. So a little bit about who the UK Atomic Energy Authority are. As I said, they are a <clears throat> scientific research facility in South Oxfordshire. They're the UK's fusion research laboratory, and they do all sorts of research surrounding fusion. Um, so over here in this building, they do remote handling um, testing with their robotics center called RACE. Uh, in this building here, they do materials testing 
with the MRF, the Materials Research Facility. Uh, but we're going to focus on this building here, which is where the majority of the physics happens. And um, this, is, this is where they create fusion on Earth. Now, they do it a little bit differently to the sun. They use a machine called a tokamak. A tokamak is a Russian acronym, meaning toroidal chamber with magnetic coils. And as I said, it's housed in this building. Now the machine, the tokamak that the UKAA use is called JET or the Joint European Taurus. And it is hosted by the UKAA on behalf of Eurofusion. So let's take a look at what it looks like. This is an artist impression of the machine. Uh, and I say artist impression because it is exactly that. It is an artistic impression of what the machine looks like. But it's also an accurate representation of the machine. And um, resources like this are really useful, especially because it shows you what the machine should look like. And that's an important thing when the actual machine looks like this. It's quite difficult to, uh, to, to pick it out, uh, but you can see those orange limbs there around the side and you can just about see them here. Uh, but all of these wires, these pipes, the scaffolding and the everything surrounding it is all diagnostics because JET is first and foremost an experimental machine. Let's take a closer look inside. So on the left here, you have uh, what the inside of the chamber looks like. Um, and it's very sort of intricate, very detailed. You've got all these tiles, so very sort of silver and futuristic. And this is what it would look like if you were to just open the door and walk on in. But I wouldn't recommend doing that. <laughs> But what I want to bring your attention to is the picture here on the right. Now this one looks a little bit fuzzy, it looks like it's been edited, been tampered with, when in fact this is an actual photograph of what the inside of the machine looks like when we are running an experiment in JET. And this pinky purpley hue that you can see, that's the actual colour of the plasma. I bet you didn't expect it to be pink, <laughs> but I think it's beautiful, I think it's a really gorgeous thing to behold and that's the reason why we're here it's the art of fusion it's the the beauty within science and before I move on I want to just remind you of that equation I showed you at the very beginning and for some of you that might be simple enough to understand but for others perhaps those without a scientific background like myself it's quite difficult to understand what the process is when you're just looking at something like that but when I broke it down into little animations and pictures and photographs, it suddenly became a lot easier to understand the process from gas to plasma to fusion. And that is really why we're here. It's how does art influence and aid science? And on the flip side of that, how does science influence and aid art? So I'll just remind you who is joining me. We have Chantal from UKAA and Rosemary from the Department of Plant Sciences. So hello to both of you. Uh, Rosemary, I thought we'd start with uh, a couple of pictures of what your work is as a botanical artist. Um, and I'll have these up on the screen just while you uh, give us a, a little explanation of, about what a botanical artist is and um, how, is it, how is it any different from just drawing plants for pleasure? Do you think you could explain a little bit for us? Oh, I'll just unmute you. I think. Oh, hang on. <laughs> I need to work out how to unmute you. <laughs> uh, one moment. Kathy, do you think you could unmute Rosemary, please? I've asked Rosemary to unmute herself. There she goes. Ah, there we go. Okay. Lovely. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes, I'll start off by reading something I, I wrote for a publication a while back. The botanical illustrator is of a rare breed. There's a world of difference between them and the flower painter who works in a more relaxed way and can, of course, produce a very, very beautiful painting but this has no scientific value. The analytical approach of the illustrator shows compute, complete accuracy and produces a painting or a drawing that can be easily identified right down to species level. 
such works, I think, bridge the gap between art and science. Um, yes, for those who've done their maths, yes, I started in 1965. So yes, I've been there a long, long time. Um, retirement came and went, not much happened. <laughs> um, I'm also associate staff at Royal Botanic Gardens at Kew. So work, still carry on working for both of those. Um, do you want me to tell you what I'm doing mainly? I mean, my work involves mainly illustrating monographs. For instance, I've just been working for the last four years, I suppose, on a monograph of sweet potato family, the Pamir. And I've illustrated about 170 odd species, all complete with dissections, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I illustrate floras, Ill, um, scientific papers and get a lot of overseas travel but I think we'll talk a bit more about that later. Mm. In fact the, the two paintings that were on the first slide they were done in Peru and See I'll I tell you. get them back up. Okay. Is that... Is that back okay. up? Yeah that's yeah. back up. There we go. <laughs> okay I'll tell you a little bit about these. Um, Terry Pennington, Dr. Pen Terry Pennington from the Royal Botanic Gardens Q, uh, wrote a book on the tree flora of Peru. I illustrated uh, 917 species in black and white for that, but then Terry decided it'd be rather nice to have some colour, so he took me to Peru twice. Uh, we travelled around vast distances uh, with a technician, so Terry and the technician were frequently stopping the car to collect plants and then wherever we stayed that night the following day they'd be processing their plants and I had that day for painting. So each painting I did was A3. The one on the left represents the dry forest and the one on the left on the right is of um, I can't remember its name right off but it's a rather pretty ornamental tree that we found growing in a little town called Lema Bamba. <clears throat> but luckily I worked very quickly. So A3 paintings, I had one day each to complete them completely. Um, um, not very yeah. long then. <laughs> <laughs> the majority of my work is in black and white, as is, as you can see on the other plate here. This is a drawing of one of the very rarest plants on earth, which is Medusa gynae oppositifolia, which is found only on one island in the Seychelles. And this is the work I'm doing most of the time, which is just black and white uh, from herbarium specimens, trying to show all the um, necessary bits that you can uh, put in really to show that species. So mm -hmm. Sometimes it's quite a job <laughs> trying to get everything in and making a plate that balances up quite nicely. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Yeah. Well, Ch Chantal, we'll move on to you quickly and then we'll come back. Um, so Chantal, could you explain to us a little bit about what a radiometric researcher does for those of you, for those of us who don't know? Yes. Um, so it's actually it's really interesting listening um, to Rosemary talk about uh, you know just just some of the activities that you you get involved with day to day because already I can see quite a lot of uh, parallels between uh, between your work but also my work as a senior radiometric researcher which probably sounds sound strange to a few people but um, maybe when I go through some of this and we have some more discussion it will become a bit more clear. Um, so what is a senior radiometric researcher? Well, um, as, as Ella already said, you know, I have a background in physics and specifically nuclear physics. Um, so it's very much in that domain um, of physics. And what I'm particularly interested in in my role um, is measuring the, act uh, the activation of different materials in a fusion environment. So um, materials like uh, construction materials, which might be things like steel, and how steel becomes activated inside a fusion tokamak, uh, much like jet that I have uh, as my background, if you can, uh, if you can see my camera. Um, or it might be um, things like the activation of water. So we use water for cooling components inside a fusion reactor. It gets really hot in there. So to keep different components cool, we use water. 
uh, and that can become radioactive as well. And so part of my job is understanding what the processes are that make those materials radioactive uh, and what we can do about it once they are radioactive. Um, so what we can do in terms of shielding to make sure that people are protected and these devices are safe, uh, what we can do when we maybe decommission one of these machines in the future uh, and where we put the waste or how we handle the waste um, if some of it is radioactive. Um, but also some people uh, might take some of my research um, and once I've explained sort of how the materials are becoming radioactive, they might then go away and figure out a way of maybe changing the material the way that material is made so that it doesn't become radioactive and so that these machines are, are even better um, and even easier to, uh, to decommission in the future. So my work kind of has this knock-on effect and that really is why um, art is so important in my role um, because it's really all about that communication. And uh, you know, my, the work that I do would be uh, pretty pointless if I wasn't able to share it um, firstly with my colleagues um, so that they can take that work and you know, take it on to the next step. So I just look at really one piece of the puzzle um, when we come to actually making fusion power real. Um, and then my colleagues take that information and, and sort of apply their knowledge and, and together we will achieve fusion power. And so the first way that I use art um, is in that communication to other researchers. Um, and uh, you might have uh, been having a look at some of these pictures on my slide and sort of <laughs> thinking about how whack-a-mole and playing poo sticks has anything to do with fusion. So I'm going to go through these because as much as it's important that I communicate with researchers, um, I'm also very passionate about communicating science and the importance of my work to everyone because um, at the end of the day, um, you know, science is important for everyone. We should understand um, you know, how things work and take an interest really in what's going on in the world. Uh, but also, you know, students and younger generations will be responsible for taking over the research that I've started and carrying on that journey in the future. So it's about sort of laying those foundations. So uh, to go through these pictures then and sort of how um, I use art in different settings to communicate uh, my research to different people. So if we go along the top row, uh, we start um, the first with a sort of the, the picture with the white background, um, which uh, would mean a lot to any scientists out there, particularly uh, any physicists. So this is, um, to me, a very beautiful picture. Uh, this is a gamma ray spectrum, um, and it's showing me for this particular piece, um, I think it was a piece of steel that I was looking at here. Um, it was activated, and it's showing me all the different things that I found in that piece of activated material. Um, so all these different colored lines are different types of nuclei that I found in that material after it had been irradiated in jet. And so this is telling us a lot about what that material is made of and, and, what, and sort of how we'll handle it in the future. Uh, then sort of taking that information of sort of activity and things becoming radioactive, when I go into uh, schools and talk to A-level students, um, that graph's not really going to mean a lot to them. So instead I break it down um, into something more simple, which is our sort of diagram of the atom that a lot of um, A-level students will be familiar with. And I've taken the nucleus of the atom and I've explained that um, uh, in this, this is actually a, a snapshot of an animation, but I've explained here that you might um, create, um, when you irradiate material, a sort of radioactive version of uh, an, a, a material called manganese. And because that's radioactive, it would decay and it will kick out a proton and a gamma ray. And I'm explaining um, that the gamma rays are really what I'm trying to measure. I capture them and then it produces that plot that was in the first picture. So it's just it's sort of explaining the process. And then moving on to primary students, um, you know, these gamma rays, when we're producing this radioactivity, 
a lot of the time it's only around for a very short amount of time you've got to grab it and take it before it disappears um, otherwise <laughs> you've lost your measurement and you've lost your uh you've lost your data you've lost uh, the record that you need to have of what happens to that material so it's a bit like whack-a-mole you've got to get the moles or the gamma rays before they disappear back down the hole um so it's partly about obviously making my job look fun and interesting um, but also making it a little bit more tangible um, as to sort of something that they can get their head around. So then if we go along uh, the bottom row, the first picture is really about um, an experiment that I did in Italy. And this is a schematic diagram of how we activated water with 14 MeV neutrons, which is a whole load of jargon that would again mean quite a lot to physicists. But when I go into schools, it needs a bit more breaking down. So rather than this um, schematic that has quite a lot of detail in there for um, other researchers. When I go into schools and talk to A-level students, I'll have, and this is a, a CAD drawing, a computer design drawing um, of what the actual experiment looked like. And I can explain what was happening uh, in something that's a sort of more real shapes than the first picture. Um, and then explaining for the last picture, so sort of how this relates to um, other games, so what we had in this activated water experiment is sort of flowing water around the system and we were putting activity into the system at one point and measuring the activity further down the line so it's kind of like playing with foo sticks and you stand on a bridge and you drop your stick in and then you go to the other side of the bridge and see it come out the other side see what came out first so uh, it's sort of analogies i think are really useful um, in sort of breaking down the information making sure it's communicated sort of in the right way. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess adapting your style of, of explaining to each of those different, you know, groups of people to, it's going to be totally different to researchers than if you're talking to A-level students and sort of adapting to a changing environment. If you're going in to talk to researchers, it might be in quite a sort of a, you know, a normal building, whereas if you're going to talk to A-level students, it might be to a, a student union or something, um, yeah. adapting that to that environment. Um, yeah, absolutely. So I'll take this slide down so that people can see, see, see your lovely faces a bit better. And uh, we'll, there we go, that's easy. Um, so yeah, so I think what we'll go back to now that we know a bit more about your respective fields is you know, is there such a thing as a typical day's work for a botanical artist and for a radiometric researcher? <laughs> Rosemary, do you wanna, do you wanna go in for that? Um, for me, no, not really. It just depends on what I'm doing that particular day and every day is different. Uh, as I said, I'm working mainly in black and white. In more normal days, <laughs> when I was working three days a week in Oxford, um, I never really knew what would be on my desk that day. I might be rejoicing in beautiful, beautiful herbarium specimens, which are press specimens mounted onto card, which is what um, I work from most of the time. Uh, sometimes they're beautifully pressed, they're in lovely condition. Uh, sometimes I'm sitting there thinking, oh hell, how am I going to cope with this? Dreadful material. <laughs> it's the only specimen in the world. The plant is perhaps extinct now. How am I going to make something attractive out of it? So, you know, there are always problems, but usually you can overcome them. Um, I also have to dissect uh, the, the plants, the flowers, um, and to do that from a dried material, from dried material, you have to rehydrate them. I just soak them in warm water with a little bit of fairy liquid. It seems to work quite well. Um, but when I was very working, technical then. <laughs> very technical indeed, yeah. But when I was working on the sweet potato family, which is convolvulus basically, you know, trying to rehydrate and dissect those very, very filmy flowers was very, very difficult. I mean, you only have to look at them and they tear. <laughs> so, so it's not, not always very easy. Um, but yes, so as I said, work at Oxford is mainly black and white. Um, I also uh, supervise the Oxford Botanic Garden and Harcourt Arboretum Floralegium group. It's a group of 14 very enthusiastic artists 
and we're all painting plants from either place for uh, for um, university archives. And that's where the digital camera comes in quite useful because uh, people collect their plant from either place and take them home. But not all flowers are like snowdrops, but they all tend to wilt in the end. So if you can take a digital photograph of how it is before you collect it, it's quite handy to use. So it's a, yeah. a very handy tool. Um, people are always ask, asking me, uh, why are there still botanical illustrators? Can't the camera take over now? Well, no, it can't, thank goodness. <laughs> um, I can be selective with what I draw. Say you've got a very bushy plant, for instance, with lots and lots of leaves. And it, a camera can take a lovely photograph of that, but the camera sees all, all is too much. Um, I can be selective and I can only put in some of the leaves, but indicate where the others were. And that the eye takes in the detail of just a few leaves for botanical purposes much more readily than seeing the whole lot. Um, using herbarium specimens on a lighter note, I can illustrate the whole growing season of that plant from bud right through to fruit in one day. And the camera can do it, but it might take a year. Um, <clears throat> And I guess that's a similar, a, a similar sort of comparison between your two roles is that you have to adapt to these environments. I mean, if you're, if you're working from a pressed specimen, uh, you know, in your office and you're drawing it and it's sort of partly decayed and putting back together the pieces and then you're going into the, the arboretum and you're drawing it from what is a, quite a fresh specimen, there's, yeah. you know, things that you have to adapt to there, which I imagine... I mean, maybe not in yeah. drawing plants, Chantel, but I imagine there's, a, there's aspects of your job that you need to adapt to pretty quickly. Yeah, I mean, there's a whole, um, almost everything really that Rosemary was saying there, I have parallels that I can draw to, you know, what I do as a physicist. And I think it's really um, interesting. So first of all, just like Rosemary, I don't have a typical day. Um, I might be in the lab one day measuring my samples with my instruments trying to measure that radioactivity um, another day I might be sitting at a computer doing simulations predicting how experiments might go or planning experiments and other days I might be in schools because I like doing a lot of outreach so I might be in schools or at the moment sitting at my computer again on zoom or something um, talking to schools but um, you know doing presentations and explaining my work to different audiences so um, so I do have quite a lot of variety um, in what I do, um, but obviously a very sort of core focus on uh, on what my my overall role is. Um, but it was particularly interesting, I think, the um, the point raised, or two two of the points Rosemary made. So the first one, obviously, adapting to um, to the conditions that we um, sort of find ourselves having to sort of deal with. So uh, I guess the case for my work um, is that sometimes when I'm measuring the radioactivity of materials. Um, that the sort of half-life or the how long that radioactivity will last for um, might be really, really small, might be like milliseconds or nanoseconds. And so I'd have to get those samples really quickly to my lab so I can measure it and record that accurately. Uh, or sometimes the radioactivity much, much, might be much longer lived. It might be seconds or days or years. Um, and so it's a much more casual walk to the lab to, to take those measurements. Um, so, you know, adapting to so, sort of what we're, we're handed, I think, uh, is, is definitely a big crossover. But the other one is um, what Rosemary was saying about how, um, you know, technology can't really replace Rosemary's role. So, the, you know, the camera is obviously a great tool to your job um, because it allows you to take those snapshots in time before those samples are decaying. But it can't really replace what you're doing because it needs that human intervention of, I guess, getting through the noise and finding what it is actually that you're trying to record. And that's really like almost exactly what being um, a gamma spectroscopist, which is a big part of my role, that's, that's basically what that job is. So, 
when we're measuring the activity of these samples, we'll measure loads and loads of different gamma rays because there's loads of gamma rays in like background, just the walls in the lab will emit gamma rays, like almost everything will emit gamma rays in some shape or form. And so our instruments are picking up all of that noise, which is a bit like the sort of bush around the plant that Rosemary is trying to, to capture. Mm. And we do have uh, tools, computer tools, computer programs that can cut away some of that noise um, and reduce some of it and try and pick out what it is that we're really interested in. Um, but uh, really it, it needs that human intervention. It needs someone who's trained in nuclear physics who actually understands what they're seeing to actually pick out the important parts and just present those um, in just the same way where Rosemary will sit down and just draw the bits of the, the plant that she's looking at that are actually relevant and need to be recorded. So yeah, there's so many crossovers. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that with both of those roles, uh, there, is, there is an obligation there to get, uh, an obligation or a responsibility to get it right, to get it, to get it accurately recorded, you know, and if it's going to be used again, that's a really important factor for both of you. Um, I know that, that Rosemary, you said that there was there, there, there are uh, botanical illustrations that have been used for years that are actually wrong. Um, yes, I, I just on odd occasions I've seen illustrations and I've thought, gosh, that doesn't look quite right. Um, <clears throat> maybe the wrong number of veins, little things that I, you know, I, I can pick up. But then you see that illustration used again in another pu publication, or you see another artist adapt that same drawing and use it. So the mistakes get perpetuated, which is very, very sad, but it, it does happen. But yeah. uh, we, we were talking the other day about the responsibility, which you've just touched on. Um, yes, I think we have a parallel there that my responsibility is to be accurate in every sense, if I can. So, as I was saying, you know, when I'm drawing a, 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 a something out, I first of all I, I look at as many herbarium specimens as I can, and read descriptions, work out which is a typical one: leaf shape, leaf length, breadth, whatever, um, and uh, draw it. But there again. I leave off all the bad bits, the insect damage, the <laughs> dying bits, the decay, um, because whatever I'm drawing needs to be fairly perfect. It's, I always say to my students, what you're drawing is typical of the species, not typical of maybe a grotty plant that you've got in front of you. It's that responsibility to get things right, knowing that your drawing probably will be reproduced in other mm. sources as well. Yeah, Absolutely. and I, I think what's, um, what's probably another quite a strong crossover um, and, and actually relates to that quite a lot is that the responsibility to get it right um, obviously has impacts in kind of teaching and, and communication, but has a really big impact on the environment. Um, and particularly for um, my area of physics, so, you know, I'm dealing with things that are radioactive. So, um, you know, it might be quite um, easy to imagine how um, if we don't record that radioactivity correctly and accurately um, and it's stored incorrectly then it can have these negative impacts on the environment or if we don't decommission uh, machines properly because I didn't understand just how high the levels of radioactivity might be um, it, it will have big knock-on effects to the environment but also if I do get it right then uh, material scientists like the ones that we have um, at UKAA, uh, you mentioned the MRF earlier, um, Ella, um, you know, those scientists, if I do get that information right, they can actually create new materials that can actually improve the way we build machines and reduce that environmental impact even more. So there's loads of benefits to actually getting it right for the environment. And I'm sure it's exactly the same for you, Rosemary. Yeah, I apologise for this little creature. She's um, <laughs> pain. <sighs> Come on, clear off. <laughs> I've just I've just noticed the time which I'm shocked by. I can't believe it's it's nearly nearly our time. But I wanted to to really quickly touch on a few more points because I, I, I'm aware that uh, we've got a few questions as well. 
So uh, speaking of the environmental impact, Chantal, about getting it right and aiding the sort of decommission of, of these machines. And if you get it right, that's going to be really beneficial. Um, mm. And Rosemary, I know that a lot of the travel that you've done overseas is to teach um, teach people about the native flora and uh, and vegetation that they have in their in their culture and community. Um, and I thought maybe you could just touch on touch on that about how important it is to to educate people about the plants that they have around them. Yeah, I've had about um, I think about forty four trips overseas. Um, <sighs> four continents which has been fantastic um, every single trip has been completely different and my requirements have been different in all of them um, we touched briefly on Peru so I won't say any more about that um, we went to the Andean valleys and produced educational posters there um, and I also taught in four three universities mainly academics, teaching them techniques of botanical illustration so that they at least would be able to illustrate their own papers, hopefully accurately. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I had four trips to what was Irian Jaya, now Papua, and that, that was uh, with Q. And we were working in the concession of the Freeport mine, a vast mining area. And obviously they'd destroyed an awful lot of the original vegetation. So it was mainly a big, big collecting trip. And we worked from sea level right up to oh, over 4,000 meters, just below the glacier on Mount Jaya. And I was painting plants typical to 10 different, very, very distinct vegetation zones. It's one of the world's richest areas of uh, flora there. and the conservationists in the mining area, they were quite anxious to know what grew in each vegetation zone so that in time they could replant and try and put right some of the damage they'd done with the mining. So that was very conservation minded. Um, I joined a, another very, very big expedition to the heart of Borneo. I'd never been camping in my life before, so it was a bit of a um, eye opener for me. Um, but how exciting for me to draw a new species on the very day it's first discovered. So that was something different. But um, we were talking about adaptations. I find that working in places like Borneo in heat of the jungle, uh, the, the paint dried far too quickly. So I had to devise a new method of painting. And in more hot, humid areas, the paint doesn't seem to dry at all. So there again, I have to find a new method. Mm. Also, technical pens don't like the heat, as I found <laughs> in the jungle in Borneo. Um, but th that, that was just the start of the tree floor of Sab and Sarawak project. Mm. And my second trip was a big, big teaching trip, trying to train up uh, quite a few artists that would work on this publication, uh, which I think is 10 volumes. I think there's just one volume left to go now. Um, I had four more trips there, uh, mainly just to work on the illustrations in Berbera, in Sabah, uh, Sarawak and Kuala Lumpur. But every, every trip has been different and I'd quite like to just finish by saying about the Seychelles. I had 15 trips there, which makes everybody very envious. And this was my own project, my very, very own project, uh, which I did in my holiday times and I searched for found, illustrated and wrote up all 80 of the endemic plants. Those are plants that grow nowhere else as the black and white uh, illustration at the beginning showed. And my, uh, my flora was published by Princeton University Press. So yeah, so there are lots and lots of similarities. Mm, as absolutely. Found, unbelievable, I had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew art and physics could be so similar? Um, I thought we'd just we'd just jump on quickly to the to the flip side of it, to how art can influence and aid science. I think it's interesting what you don't know which way I'm pointing. What you said, Rosemary, about um, about how your paints and your pens don't like the heat and the humidity, and I mean, in that sense, you know, there's probably someone 
someone out there somewhere thinking, oh, well, what ink could we use that would work in humid, you know, um, environments? And how can we make paint more useful in, in those kinds of um, environments? And Chantal, I wondered if you had any more sort of thoughts about how science has, uh, so how art has, um, how science has aided art or influenced it. Yeah, so um, I think probably the obvious one and, and certainly seeing some of the, the questions coming through um, is science fiction um, and how, um, you know, I think, um, and I might actually just say the, the question because I think it really um, starts off my point really nicely, actually. So the question is, um, do you sometimes cringe when you see sets on sci-fi films that represent future science? Um, and actually the answer's Usually, no. I mean, sometimes, yes, there are a few really, really um, cringy moments. But generally speaking, I think um, the sort of sci-fi world is a fantastic place to really explore and push the boundaries of science. So, um, you know, in the world of art, you can, you can go far beyond what reality will allow you to do. And, you know, as a physicist, I'm constrained by, you know, what I can physically do. And so I think it's really important to have sort of sci-fi novels and sci-fi films that really take a sort of scientific idea or a theory um, and put it into a sci-fi context and, you know, create something like the Iron Man suit or flying cars or teleportation or time travel and really play with it because I think it actually ends up inspiring a lot of scientists where you know a lot of the time it may not have a huge amount of scientific um, accuracy um, to it but it actually inspires us to say well you know we'll start off by saying well like, that's never going to work that's a really stupid idea and then we sort of start playing with it and then eventually we end up with um, you know, the sort of the, the, the future thing that we, we end up creating. So um, I think it can actually be a really good inspirational tool um, and it's a bit of fun. Absolutely. Uh, I, I cannot believe how quickly this has gone by, but I need to, uh, I, I'm going to jump quickly back on to explaining about the um, art competition that the UKAA are running. And then uh, it looks like we might run over a little bit. I hope people will stick around to uh, go through the questions because I, I will get to those. Uh, very quickly, but I'm just gonna, uh, we back up on there. Yeah. Is that, can you see that? Oh, yeah, I can see that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, cool. Uh, so yes, yeah, so we're running an art competition called The Art of Fusion. Um, this is an opportunity for the public to show us what their interpretation of fusion is. Uh, it's open to anyone in the UK. There are three age categories, seven to 12 years old, 13 to 17 years old and 18 years and over. Your entry can be any type of visual artwork. It can be a painting, drawing, textiles, photography, computer aided design, printing or a collage. And to enter, all you need to do is go to ccfe.ukaa.uk forward slash art of fusion. And it's open for a month. So the deadline is the 9th of November. Winners and runners up will win a private virtual tour of JET with an introductory, introductory talk about who the UKAA are and how they are researching fusion and helping towards a cleaner future. The winners will also have their entries displayed at local Oxfordshire gallery, the Cornerstone in Didcot at some point in the new year when places are allowed to open again due to coronavirus. Um, they'll also be featured on their website and turned into postcards which the UKAA outreach team will use to promote fusion at festivals. Um, the UKAA have a couple of other events coming up as part of the IF festival. Uh, so on Sunday, we've got the challenge of remote engineering. And then on the 17th, we've got the Explorer Zone. So please do check out some more of our events. And then that brings me to the end of my slides. And if you want to find out more, please go to our website, our social media. If you want to know more about Rosemary's department in the Department of Plant Sciences, please follow them at Oxford Biology and Biology Oxford on Twitter and Instagram. I'll leave this up uh, and hopefully Dane's going to let me answer some questions. <laughs> so I will do that, uh, absolutely. But what I'm going to do just now, because we are at the end of the timed part of the event, uh, so I'm going to thank everyone for coming. Please do stick around. We're just going to extend the event for 10 minutes or so, just so we can rattle through these questions. There are some really fun ones 
uh, that I think Ella and uh, Chantelle and Rosemary are going to answer. Um, but thanks again for coming. Uh, there will be a feedback email that's coming to you, so please fill that in. We always want to know what people think of festival events so we can plan next year's festival to make it better. Uh, and of course, if you want to make a donation, that will also contribute to next year's festival too. I would definitely recommend booking yourselves onto the Explorer Zone Digital on the 17th of October. It's really going to be an enormous extravaganza of science, technology, engineering, art, maths, and all the rest of the fun stuff that If Oxford is all about. So please register for that. Uh, and thank you again for coming. Uh, but if uh, you want to hang around for the next 10 minutes, we're going to whiz through these questions relatively quickly. I'm sure we've all got things that we'd um, like to know about fusion. So uh, I, would, I would like to know a little bit actually about the, um, so one of the questions here was around, we asked about gamma rays being detected and some other kind of ideas around sort of sci-fi. And the way that sort of illustration has developed over the past, you know, um, well, decades actually, is how how do we think that kind of illustrative techniques and specifically gaming and sort of computer graphics and even sort of AI kind of artistic kind of programs, how do you think they might kind of change the nature of scientific and botanical kind of drawings uh, in the next few years, do you think? So, if it's okay to go first, um... I, actually, I think it's already um, changing the landscape of it, of how we communicate um, and interact in the world of, uh, of physics and, and what we're doing at UKAA. Um, so thinking about um, the sort of advances that gaming have given us, where we can actually go into virtual reality worlds, um, you know, the one... Um, I guess I can go through my three groups again, but like on the sort of researcher side, that has huge benefits in terms of training. Um, so one um, thing that we can do for, for virtual reality um, is um, Ella mentioned that we have this robotics group um, at UK AEA. Um, and so they operate machinery to maintain and replace different parts of JET. Um, sometimes we have to send people into JET to do those jobs because the robots can't get to certain places. And so it's really important that you know, before we let people loose with a massive robot roaming around jet to do these things or send people in, that they are fully trained. They know exactly what they're doing, exactly where they're going um, to minimize their exposure to radioactivity and all different things like that. And so uh, VR, virtual reality can really help um, in terms of training um, in a sort of safe environment, I guess. And then, you know, down to the other end, so the sort of outreach end with students, but also the general public, um, something that the UK AA uh, produced recently that I was uh, really excited to see uh, is a real virtual reality tour of JET, which is absolutely fantastic. So if you are a school or, you know, interested in booking like public events, like definitely go onto the website and do that because, because of, uh, you know, the times we're in now, everything's virtual. Uh, they created this virtual tour of JET. Um, and so taking that technology and allowing us to still communicate with people when we're all spread across the country i think that's that's you know one really great way to use it and you will so see that virtual like tour. Playing computer games as a career then is that right you sort of you know that game kind of second life or Fortnite. yeah is yeah, that, yeah that i think like so sometimes? yeah <laughs> i think i think it does feel like that sometimes you know i think as we rely more and more on computers to do things i think it does kind of feel almost like we're playing a game um i guess it makes work a bit more fun <laughs> There's been a few questions as well about the sort of the ways you activate plasmas around sort of um, radio frequency uh, and other different sorts of spectroscopy involved um, in sort of looking at the plasma. Um, I, you know, the colours that you showed before were really quite beautiful, almost like the kind of aurora, and sometimes taken by even just a simple candle flame being quite different colours. I remember when we were talking about like leaf shape. Um, and obviously a candle is that kind of shape and people might even draw, draw inspiration from all sorts of different kind of um, lights, plasmas uh, and sort of physical phenomena. Um, a question that someone's asked is, what is your favourite piece of artwork and possibly also scientific fact? And that can be for maybe all three of you, actually. Hmm. Rosemary, do you want to go first this time, Rosemary? Yep, OK. Right, one of my predecessors at Oxford it was uh, Ferdinand Bauer, who is possibly the greatest botanical artist ever. In my book, he is the greatest. I, he went in the 1700s to Greece to draw uh, 
the Flora, for, for the Flora Graker pro project. Um, poor guy, you know, we were talking about how science has um, influenced art. Well, I mean, that comes into it really there because I mean, one, of the, one of the first things I could think of was air travel. Um, so much easier now. This poor guy had to use um, boat, carriage, horseback, and even walking to get to Greece. Um, but at any rate, the Flora Graker, the paintings he did for that, I think are the, the greatest illustrations ever. So I would say, yeah, he's my favorite. And of course, in this digital age, you can go online and you can see them. Look up F Ferdinand Bauer. Um, so I'll go next. So um, certainly, um, in I'll, I'll keep it to the, the sort of fusion world uh, for my sort of great artwork. Um, you know, obviously I love jet, um, but there's lots of different types of fusion devices, and um, and actually some of my favourite pictures that come out of fusion are of stellarators, and I encourage you to Google them uh, because they are a bit weird. Um, they're basically, um, if you took like a donut and just sort of like twisted it and it just sort of spiraled round in a circle, that's kind of what a stellarator looks like. It's this kind of huge deformed lump of metal and um, it just looks really, uh, the, the drawings of them are really crazy to look at, but then actually thinking of it from a scientific point of view of like how you'd make it and use it, it just sort of blows my mind a bit that they're actually trying to make these devices. So yeah, I really like looking at those. Um, okay, for, for I guess for favourite piece of art, I, is, <laughs> it's, it's not here, but it's by the same artist that has uh, done this picture behind me. It's a friend of mine, Zoe Walker. She's an Oxford-based Oxford artist and she does just the most beautiful abstract art. And uh, I've got another piece of hers downstairs, which are these sort of bluey, um, turquoisey and white uh, acrylic on canvas. And I, I'm completely obsessed with her artwork. And it'd probably be a di bit different from uh, from scientific art, but that's definitely my favourite piece at the moment. I, should, I, I wish I had it. I wish I had it with me. I could show you, but um, yeah. So there are a couple of really technical questions, which I don't think um, we really have the amount of time that we'd like to go into. So I'm just going to put it into the chat box. Um, there's a website on the UK AA page. Uh, that is listing some of the scientific publications and conference papers that if you want to browse that afterwards, I'd recommend you have a look there. Some people are asking around the different sorts of detectors. I guess people are really curious about how the machines can see different aspects of the plasmas using um, sort of technical methods and not just the kind of human and creative eye. Um, so I'm going to just use that website to answer that question, if that's all right. That's fine. And as well, if you want to email the address that's on the screen, um, we can direct that email to, to, to Chantelle, really. <laughs> but it's straight through to Chantelle. So yeah, if you do want to email any other questions that we don't have time to answer today, then please do. That's communications at ukaa.uk. So there's Another question about the art forms uh, from Ian. So asking, are there any other art forms that Rosemary or Chantelle, what would you, you know, would you like to see these, uh, any other art forms applied um, to sort of, you know, fusion technologies or other kind of scientific specialisms? What do you think might make a good artistic, um, you know, style, for instance? Did you want to go first again, Rosemary? No, Chantelle can go first because I'm thinking. <laughs> I was thinking. <laughs> I really like the way, so, you know, the, the classic kind of botanic drawings, mm -hmm. as, as you were saying earlier on, you're not representing a particular plant, you're representing like, the, gen the general kind of type of species. Um, so I really like the way that a sort of a, t a technical sort of botanic drawing kind of works. And you see those really lovely um, sort of mid-century kind of drawings of atoms and crystals that kind of use almost... Mm -hmm. Um, Euclidean shapes and platonic solid kind of ideas to kind of have quite stylized um, ideas of how kind of atomic uh, structures, crystals, molecular orbitals and things like that are kind of put together. Um, so I don't know if that's, I, mean, I certainly quite like that sort of quite flat graphic to represent three dimensional things like a Picasso. Yeah, I think certainly from a perspective of inspiring people and, um, you know, finding the real sort of 
beauty that's deep within physics. I think, um, you know, all of the sort of abstract methods of, of art, I think we definitely don't see enough of that, you know, um, certainly from my physicist perspective, we're all about, we're maybe a bit too real. Um, we're just sort of drawing what we see or rep representing what we see. So, uh, you know, I think certainly there's there's a massive space for the more abstract features of art. But I think also mm. when I'm trying to explain things to people, I think often I find that um, all of the art that I'm using is much too static. Now, I did, purposefully didn't use animations and videos today because it doesn't necessarily go so well uh, with people's sort of different broadband speeds. But I think this, there's also a place for more um, sort of digital art, um, but also sort of animated or videos and, um, and, and that as well. And sort of, again, sort of using the technology that's coming out and, and those skills. So, yeah, both ends of the spectrum. And I think as well, just jumping off the back of that is... I mean, that's exactly what the, this art competition is all about, is getting those different, different viewpoints, different, you know, interpretations of science, of fusion, of the, all of the different aspects that go into it and seeing it through new eyes, seeing it through different eyes, you know, looking at the, the picture that Chantal's got as, as her background and going, wow, that's a really gorgeous colour and I love the grey as well. How can I turn that into a different representation? And that's what... I mean, I personally am really excited about this competition is to see what people take from fusion. It could be anything, you know, the, the sun, the stars, it could be the machine, it could be the colours. What are we going to what are we going to see and what interpretations are going to come out of it? Um, but yeah, I yeah. That. and so I think much that. like the sci fi comics, it kind of has that sort of self feeding loop where, you know, we've built something and then you've seen it through a different eye in your art and you've presented it in a different way and then that in turn inspires us and makes us think about things differently and it just sort of creates this self-feeding loop of sort of innovation and, um, and things so yeah I think there's lots of opportunity. So maybe that's some tips for people who are thinking about entering the competition then try and think outside the box and use different sorts of creative methods to get your imagination across. I think I'm going to kind of try and draw this one to a close, but I would quite like to know how long does it take to train to be a professional artist? So all of those people who are kind of developing their kind of artistic practice now and might be frustrated by, you know, maybe finding it difficult to kind of capture what they can see. How long would you say it takes uh, of practice to be able to kind of draw natural objects in a way that look realistic and faithful to what they are? Yeah, that's, that's a difficult one. Um, I mean, some people are obviously born with more talent for drawing than others. <clears throat> I mean, I always knew I wanted to be an artist of some sort from the age of four and never changed my mind. And also my children, they're both, they've both got degrees in art in some form or another. So I think it's probably quite a strong gene. But I don't know, with my teaching, I get people who say, I can't draw. And I say, I will teach you to draw. And um, it, I mean, in my line, it's uh, probably a different form of art. Um, it's a lot of measuring involved. So it's much more scientific than artistic. Um, I mean, my, my old supervisor at Oxford, he couldn't draw, but uh, he used to, when I first went there, he used to say, Rosemary, I can't draw, but I can tell if a line is two millimeters out. And, you know, <laughs> I think I've inherited this from him because when I'm teaching, I find myself saying, I can tell, I can notice if a line is two millimetres out, so be very careful. Um, yeah, I mean, the floor region people that I supervise, some of those have never used ink before, but they soon got the hang of it and they're doing very, very nice work now. So I think once you, you get the ideas that this is a different sort of art, everything has to be accurate, everything has to be measured, um, then you're halfway there. So maybe a bit of patience. But patience you're always learning. You never, ever, you never ever stop learning. I think the day you feel you've learned it all is the day you should give up. <laughs> well, and, when, and we don't want to be giving up, so maybe we'll all keep striving to keep on learning, asking questions, poking around at the edges of what we understand and know and to try and be better each time. Uh, I think that's a really nice moment to stop. 
Um, there are more questions, um, but as I mentioned before, on the um, on the Explorer Zone digital event, the UKAEA is going to be there again. So if you do have more questions, there's plenty of opportunity to kind of ask all the questions you like from Saturday the 17th of October at the Explorer Zone digital um, UKAEA stand. I think this uh, event tonight has been really fun. Uh, so thanks so much for Ella, Rosemary, Chantel for stimulating some really interesting discussions and getting people thinking about the connections and fusion and overlap between science and art. That's a really nice thing to do uh, tonight. So thanks a lot. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. It's been really good, some really great questions and we hope to see you again.